Last summer, my wife and I installed this mini split system while we were building our backyard office. HVAC is one of those things where it kind of just feels like magic. How is this little box just pumping out cold air in the summer and hot air in the winter? With the right use of practical examples and visual effects, I think anyone can get an understanding of how this all works. It's the way I like to learn, and it's the reason I wanted to start this channel. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the different types of HVAC systems, how they work, and how we installed this one ourselves. My name is Gianni, and I'm going to be using my experience as an engineer, along with my interest in visual effects, to cover all sorts of DIY projects. Thank you to Pioneer for sponsoring today's video. Let's start by taking a look at our house. This box is what's called a packaged unit, and let's oversimplify what that is. Let's just think of it as a black box that takes air in, changes its temperature, and then sends it back out. Using a system of ductwork, we're pulling air from a single intake that's probably close to the center of the home. We draw this air out to the unit, we change its temperature, and then we supply it back through many vents, at least one in each room to help balance the system. The idea behind a ductless mini split is what if we take this black box from out in the yard, we shrink it down, and we place it directly in the room. We don't have to worry about transporting the air, and we can directly influence the temperature right at the unit. Now, you'd need a few of these for an entire home, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You'll be able to control the temperature of each zone independently from one another. So let's say it's nighttime in summer, and we only care about cooling the bedrooms. We can let the living space throttle back, use a little less energy, and then we can pick it back up in the morning to cool the rest of the house off. But getting back to this unit, there's a reason it's located outside. When we're cooling air that passes through it, we're accomplishing this by absorbing some of its heat and releasing it. If we just release that heat back in the room, we would have no effect on the temperature at all. So to get around this, the mini split still needs an exterior unit. We're collecting the energy right in the room, but we pipe it outside before we release it. That's why it's called the split system. You have one part of the system inside, and the other half is out here. You can also have a ducted split system, which is sort of a combination of the two we've discussed so far, and it's the most common option in the United States. You have a single inside unit that's fed by ductwork, but it still connects to a separate exterior unit. This could be an entire video just talking about which system is right for your home, but there are a lot of things that go into that, like how large is your house? How well insulated is it? Do you have room for ductwork? Which climate do you live in? We're just gonna focus on what we decided to do for the office, but I'd love to see more discussion on this in the comments. For us, it was a pretty easy decision. We have a very well insulated small building in a mild climate, specifically climate zone three of the US. A ductless mini split is gonna be the easiest system to install, and it's also gonna be the most energy efficient. So we're sitting in our new office and it's full of air. What does it mean for that air to have temperature? Well, it isn't all just one thing. It's millions of tiny particles that are all flying around. Temperature is just a measure of the average speed of those particles. If the particles speed up, the air is hotter, and if they slow down, the air is cooler. So Judy Ann is here in the room with me, and let's assume that she is colder than the air. Now obviously her particles aren't just flying all over the place like a gas. She is more solid, which means her particles are pretty well locked together. But they do vibrate in place, and this movement still has a speed, and the average speed across all of those particles gives her a temperature. So now everything is colliding with one another and she is going to start warming up. The air will cool slightly as some of its particles lose their energy to her. Heat will always flow from an area of higher temperature to that of a lower. At some point, we'll assume it all equalizes when Judy Ann and the air have roughly the same temperature. Now she's going to step outside where the air is much, much colder. What? Obviously the opposite is now taking place. The particles out here are moving slower and are absorbing energy, cooling her off. As she keeps repeating this, she's gradually reducing the temperature inside as she dissipates the heat outdoors. The water loop in my computer works in a very similar way, absorbing heat from the different components and then releasing it to the air using radiators. But we aren't able to cool the computer down past the temperature of the room. And in the previous example, we won't be able to get the office any cooler than it is outside. This will be a real problem in summer when it's 90 degrees out there and we'll want it to be closer to 70 degrees in here. 
To accomplish this, we'll have to take a closer look at pressure and its relationship to temperature. Say we have this closed can with a gas inside that's the same temperature as the surrounding air. If we were to quickly crush this can down to half its size, the pressure inside would double and the gas inside would get hotter. Now if we wait, the heat will bleed off into the surrounding air and the temperature will once again equalize. Now if we quickly pull the can back to its original shape, the pressure inside will drop and the contents will become cold. We'll absorb heat back from the surrounding air and return to a similar state from which we started. To show how this can help us, I'm gonna start with a pre-crushed can inside of the office. I'm trying to lower the temperature of this room, so I'm gonna allow the can to expand back to its original shape, which will cause the pressure inside to drop. And it's gonna start absorbing heat from the surrounding air. Now that we're outside, we can crush the can again, and it's gonna become hotter than the surrounding air, so it'll reject the heat that we just absorbed inside of the shed. You can think of it like we're using pressure to turn this can into a sponge that absorbs and releases heat where we want it. If we wanted to heat up the inside of the shed, we could use this same can. We would just expand it out here and then crush it inside. This is how a heat pump works. We'll talk about it more when we explore the full system. Next, let's look at what happens during the phase change of a material. Here we have a small sample of frozen water molecules. The particles are each drawn towards each other with attractive forces, and when they're moving slow enough, they can't escape this force, and they lock into place. This is why a material freezes. Now if we start adding energy back in at a constant rate, we can get the particles to start vibrating with more intensity, which raises the temperature. The temperature will continue to rise until we get to the point where the ice begins to melt. We're still adding heat, but this energy isn't just speeding up the particles. It's helping them break free from one another so it can start flowing as a liquid. This melting process is going to absorb a lot of energy before there is any temperature change, and it's similar once we reach the boiling point. We'll have to add an even greater amount of energy to get the particles fast enough that they can totally decouple and become a gas. This is called latent heat, but all you have to remember is that materials absorb much more energy when they're going through a phase change. Let's return to the can crushing example to see how we might use what we just learned about latent heat. Let's compare two different cans. The one on the left is like the one we already talked about. It's full of a gas that remains in the same phase throughout the pressure cycle. The one on the right, however, is full of a material that exists as a gas under starting pressure, but it's going to condense into a liquid as soon as we increase the pressure. This happens because pressure forces the particles of a gas closer together to the point where they can't escape the attractive forces from one another, and it can change phase while remaining at the same temperature. The strength of this attractive force can vary, and it's the reason why every material has a unique melting and boiling point. We use refrigerant like the contents of this can because they conveniently change phase at the temperatures and pressures we're gonna be using in our system. So we crush both cans, and both become hotter than the surrounding air. The can on the left equalizes quickly, but the can on the right continues to give off much more heat while its contents change phase. We'll see a similar outcome on the other side of the cycle. The refrigerant wants to return to a gas now that it's back to its starting pressure, and it sucks up a lot of energy in order to boil off. Now that we've covered these examples, we're ready to tackle the refrigerant loop used by our mini split. Like we discussed earlier, there are two main components to this system an exterior unit, otherwise called a condenser, and an interior unit, known as an evaporator. We have two pipes connecting these units. We're gonna start with the supply side, which flows towards the evaporator. This is also known as the liquid side, and the refrigerant is flowing here under relatively low pressure and low temperature, up to the evaporator inside. Next, it begins its path through the interior coil, where it interacts with the air inside of our building. A fan pulls warm air from the top of the unit down through the coil and then back out the front. The liquid refrigerant begins to boil as it absorbs heat from the air. Like we described earlier, this phase change allows the refrigerant to suck up a lot of energy. And for most of the coil, the temperature of the refrigerant isn't actually rising. All of the energy it collects goes directly towards helping those particles break free from one another. It's not until all of the refrigerant turns to a gas that its temperature finally begins to rise. The gas then begins its journey back outside. Once it's inside of the exterior unit, it travels through a four-way valve and an accumulator. 
We'll talk more about the four-way valve in a little bit, but the accumulator is just a small device that makes sure that only vapor refrigerant can continue on. If we still have liquefied refrigerant by this step, it'll just collect at the bottom before it eventually boils off. The vapor then enters the compressor. Gas is pulled into a chamber and squeezed into a smaller volume by this rolling piston. This raises the pressure and temperature of the gas before it exits. This is the hottest point in the cycle, with a refrigerant temperature somewhere around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that the vapor is so hot, it can give off heat to the outside air. As it travels through the exterior coil, it loses energy and begins to condense back into a liquid. Just like before, it maintains that same high temperature during its entire phase change, which helps improve efficiency of the system. Now that it's a liquid again, it's almost ready to complete the cycle, but it's still at a high pressure from the compressor. At this point, it travels through a capillary tube, which is used to drop the pressure. This is a really simple device that restricts the fluid through a small diameter tube for a long distance. When it exits the other side, it expands into a larger volume, which lowers its pressure and temperature. It's now ready to begin the cycle all over again. Here's a simplified visual to show all of the elements of the system together in one place. One of the coolest things about this system is that it's reversible. Remember that four-way valve from earlier? Using that, we can change the flow of refrigerant so we can also use this unit for heating. We'll instead absorb heat from the exterior air and release it inside. This is how a heat pump functions, and it's very efficient because we're just taking existing energy and moving it. Although the colder it is outside, the harder the system has to work since there is less available energy. If you live in a particularly cold climate, some heat pumps can't keep up, especially if the home isn't well insulated. Now let's shift gears and talk about some considerations when designing for a mini split. Of course, you'll have to find a location for the interior unit. Pioneer gave the following recommendations for mine, between 80 inches and 100 inches off the ground, and no closer than three inches to a sidewall. There are some other styles for the interior unit, including some that sit flush in the ceiling, but I'm happy with this one. I think it looks nice centered over the window like this. I also added this small concrete pad to support our condenser unit. This is one solution, or you can purchase a couple brackets that bolt to the side of your home. You will have some vibration from the unit that could transfer to the wall. This could make some noise inside of the office, so I decided to be safe and go with an isolated pad. For power, this system runs off a dedicated 20 amp GFCI breaker. This runs through the wall and out to a disconnect on the outside of the office. This disconnect is very important and where I live, it's required by code. Something I read that I figured was probably a good idea is to have this disconnect off to the side rather than right over the unit. In a worst case scenario, if you had some kind of hazard from the unit, you'd still be able to get to the disconnect easily. So what was it like installing a mini split? Well, first I did a lot of online research before I decided on this unit from Pioneer. I purchased and installed it before having any contact with them and we've been really happy with the unit. We're incredibly fortunate to have them as the sponsor for today's video, and I just want to give them a quick thanks for supporting our new channel. Use the code VISUALTHINKER10 to get 10% off of your order. I'll have a link in the description as well. Alright, so I've already covered this installation in one of my other videos, but I'll recap it quickly. First, I had to hang a wall bracket for the interior unit, and then I used a stencil provided by Pioneer to drill a hole for our connections to the outdoor unit. On the outside, I did have to jog my lines over a little bit before I could come straight down next to the window. This is where I made the biggest mistake of my install. I purchased a 10-foot piping kit when I really should have went with a longer one that I could cut down. The result was my piping just barely reaching down to the unit. I even had to add these spacers to get this little bit of extra height to make my connections. Do not make the same mistake. Get some extra length and then cut it down to exactly what you need. At some point, I'll get some nicer feet under this unit and I'll try to come up with some sort of custom cladding to tidy up this appearance. Once I made the connections between the two units, I had to pull a vacuum on the piping. The refrigerant comes stored in the condenser unit and before we can release it, we wanna make sure we get rid of everything else that's stuck in the system. So we're sucking it out with this blue vacuum pump and we're gonna let it sit for an hour so we can make sure we don't have any leaks in our connections. At that point, I release a little bit of refrigerant 
And again, I'm gonna let this sit so I can monitor for leaks. Soapy water is another good way to check. You would see large bubbles forming if we had any gas escaping. But we're all good. So I'm fully opening these valves and the system is ready to go. This channel is gonna to continue to be a mixture of educational content along with all kinds of custom builds. Coming up, we're turning our focus back to our office interior, and I hope you'll stay tuned for those exciting projects. I make all of these animations myself using Blender, the free animation software. Be sure to check out our Instagram for content related to making these videos, as well as some more frequent updates. Thank you so much for watching.